Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Friday, April 6, 2018. Some of my Facebook friends know I was up early today. From the Secret Studio, we launched a new radio program called Tay Radio Marin, hosted by high school students. And I'm pretty proud of those youngsters and the work they're doing. I'm also proud of the comments that Bernie Sanders made in Jackson, Mississippi the other day, and they have been distorted and misinterpreted in what appears to be an intentional move by African-American supporters of Hillary Clinton and perhaps Bill Clinton, too, to tarnish Bernie's image and falsely claim that he attacked Barack Obama in a talk that he gave in a 50-year commemoration of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. It started with a story from BuzzFeed, lead reporter Ruby Kramer, and I consider this to be a biased article. I've linked to it in the show file for this podcast. Examine it for yourself and let me know if you agree, because what what they did here was serve up a lot of rehashes from the 2016 campaign because Hillary Clinton trounced Bernie Sanders in Mississippi. It's a state that neither of them could carry in the general election. But Hillary benefited from the blessing of Barack Obama and the affection that many African Americans have held for Bill Clinton over the years. And so in a speech to a group in Jackson where the focus was economic justice, that's Bernie's wheelhouse. Maybe people get tired of it because he does say the same stuff over and over again. But in this speech, he said, the business model, if you like, of the Democratic Party for the last 15 years or so has been a failure. Sometimes people don't see that because there was a charismatic individual named Barack Obama who won the presidency in 2008 and 2012. He was obviously an extraordinary candidate, brilliant guy. But behind that reality, over the last 10 years, Democrats have lost about 1,000 seats in state legislatures all across this country. Now, everything he said is factual. But because he mentioned Barack Obama in the same breath where he criticized the business model of the Democratic Party, of which, sure, Obama was the leader, this is seen as some kind of an unfair swipe against Obama. So they trot out Joshua Du Bois, a strategist who led Obama's faith-based initiative. Bernie's comments were tone-deaf and will not help him with communities of color, especially black folks. On that hallowed day, our focus should have been on the transformative legacy of Dr. King and how we can come together to continue King's fight against systemic racism and injustice. But the topic was economic justice. And on that issue, the Democrats have failed. They now represent the professional class. Read Tom Frank's Listen Liberal. They don't represent the working poor, and they pay lip service to African Americans, and then they wedge them in, saying, well, they won't dare vote for a Republican. And what's his name, Weaver? Uh, I forget his first name. (laughs) Jeff Weaver, Sanders' uh, spokesperson, longtime campaign advisor, said that uh, these individuals are trying to sow racial division by deliberately misinterpreting the senator's remarks. Here's another tweet from Bakari Sellers. Y'all can defend Bernie all you want. On MLK 50, his lack of self-awareness and arrogance in dismissing President 44 is wild. Bernie 2020 died 4418. Now, these are extremely emotional attacks on Sanders. And when Bakari Sellers responded to a comment that I just quoted from Jeff Weaver. Well, actually, it's an additional comment. Weaver said that Sanders' critics were trying to sow racial division. Oh, I I did say that, okay. (laughs) Well, what Sellers said with an emotional non sequitur is, well, my father was shot because of racial division. Weaver should find another line of attack because I will not dignify that. Now, excuse me, but that is using the blood of a civil rights activist, 
who happens to be this man's father, and using that to try to silence, to demagogue, the refutation from Sanders' representative. And, and I find this really offensive. I truly do. Now, let me say that Bernie Sanders did get punked by Black Lives Matter activists during the 2016 campaign. He was a little flat-footed, a little slow to understand the importance of the killing, the well, the death in prison of Sandra Bland. But I think that he did retune his campaign and that he did ultimately address those issues. And it shows in the current polling. The most popular Democratic leader among young African Americans is Bernie Sanders. But you wouldn't know that from these distressed comments. Now, I do not know the race of this person. Uh, It's a tweet from Ange Amin. Bernie Sanders' dislike of Barack Obama's administration slash policies is what connects him to Trump voters. Really? (laughs) So Obama is sacrosanct. He's now a saint among the Democratic establishment and loyalists. And I've been a sharp critic of many of the policies of Barack Obama, and I won't stop. And it's not based on race. It's based on honest criticism. Here is, uh, I can tell from the picture of the tweeter, Regnarik Lobster. The hills are alive with the sound of white people explaining why it was okay for Bernie Sanders to travel to Jackson and shit on Obama's legacy on the 50th anniversary of King's assassination. Then Mr. Weeks, can't quite tell from this image uh, what his race might be. He writes, Dr. Martin Luther King warned us about white progressives like Bernie Sanders in his letter from Birmingham prison. On the 50th anniversary, he decides it was appropriate to attack President Obama and belittle the work Democrats have done for America in 15 years. The Democrats are a failure. They couldn't defeat the most obviously unqualified candidate for president in American history. And they didn't elect a majority to the Congress, either the House or the Senate. They've lost over 30 state legislatures over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Now, let me let me correct that. They didn't have all of those, but they 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 lose. They have they have lost control where the trifecta exists, where Republicans have both houses and the governorship in at least 30 states. And so to acknowledge that failure in an effort to move forward and defeat the dark forces of the right, we see Clintonism resurface to try to stuff the comments of Bernie Sanders. And Exhibit A here comes from my old pal Paul Waldman. He frequently publishes op-eds in the Washington Post, and yesterday he had one based on this comment that Sanders made in Jackson, Mississippi. And I know Paul Waldman. When I had the syndicated radio show from 2005 to 2009, Paul was working for David Brock at Media Matters. And we routinely did a feature. It was a weekly thing where a Media Matters person would call into the show. We'd talk about what Fox News had done wrong that week and how crazy Rush Limbaugh was. And Paul Waldman was really good at that. He's a good partisan fighter. But I don't agree with Paul on his take. The op-ed is entitled, No, the Democratic Party Isn't Divided or in Disarray. And I reached out to Paul yesterday. We traded a couple of emails. I asked him to give me an interview so we could hash this over. And he uh, dodged the opportunity based on scheduling issues. When I replied to him, you name the time, (laughs) he just basically said his family commitments don't allow him uh, to talk. And, you know, nobody is required to accept my invitation. But Paul knows my politics and probably didn't want to get into an argument. So I'm going to argue with him in absentia. He writes, Many people on the right, the left, and the media will be saying, as we head toward the next election, that Democrats are in the throes of an identity crisis, a struggle for their party soul that will tear tear them apart. But they aren't, and they won't be. The Democratic Party screws up plenty, contains its share of idiots, but when it comes to its identity, it's doing just fine. Really, Paul? What does it stand for? The only thing it stands for today is we ain't Trump. 
And last time it was We Ain't Romney. And before that it was We Ain't McCain. Or Palin. And before that it was We Ain't Bush. But there is little that distinguishes the parties on critical issues like war, surveillance, the economy. I mean, there are a lot of Democrats who still don't support a $15 minimum wage. They are captive to their corporate donors. And as you know, I believe the Democratic Party is a failed brand in need of a complete reboot. So Waldman goes back and forth in this piece. I encourage you to read it. He does admit, he says, in Sanders' defense, the event was billed as examining economic justice 50 years later. And if you listen to all of his remarks, there isn't that much any Democrat would object to, even if you take issue with his apparent belief that Democratic losses at the state level happened because the party didn't provide a sufficiently leftist economic agenda and not because there was a powerful racial backlash against the Obama presidency. And then he goes on to say that if Sanders 2020 happens, it'll be a far more diminished force. And he makes some predictions. In 2020, you'll likely have a dozen Democrats running, many compelling in their own ways. Most of the people who supported Sanders last time around will peel off to other candidates. Now, this is pure speculation, and (laughs) he's entitled to it. But what's that based on? We really don't know. I don't know. And for him to say he does... Sorry, Paul, that damages your credibility. Then he goes on, based on that speculation, to say, those who remain with Sanders will be in no small part a rump faction of anti-Democrat Democrats who share Sanders' conviction that the party is irredeemably corrupt and a collection of neoliberal corporate sellouts. This is the essence of the Sanders brand. So he branches out from embracing the attacks by African Americans after saying that, you know, what he said really wasn't that uh, offensive or inaccurate. (laughs) And then he marginalized Sanders, saying that he's just a crank who basically exists to oppose what he sees as the excesses of the Democratic Party. And let me say that Sanders has a lot of weaknesses, foreign policy, He barely addressed surveillance. He's not a pacifist. He has not staked out positions against war. He's been tepid, but uh, sometimes the only Democrat speaking up in support of the rights of the Palestinians. But he's far from perfect. And I voted for him because he was the best available choice, but that doesn't mean that I am blind to his faults. So... This pitch by Paul Waldman, where he you know, says, well, to be clear, Sanders has played a vital role in pushing the party to the left. That's been a good development for the party and the country. So what's your problem, Paul? Why is he the anti-Democrat Democrat? And why do you cling to some unprovable belief that the Democrats are in decent shape? He says, well, there are reasons, serious reasons to believe a real comeback is underway. Democrats have won nearly every off-year and special election. Yeah, they brought us Doug Jones from Alabama, who barely beat the accused child molester and bizarre Bible thumper Roy Moore. And then there's Connor Lamb from Pittsburgh. You're going to hold him up as some symbol of democratic strength for the future? And... My final comment to Paul Waldman is next to the email I got back from him today, basically saying he doesn't want to do an interview. I got an email from DNC HQ with a nice little infographic framing a video that I'm supposed to watch. And it asks the question, what does the Democratic Party stand for? And the answer is given on the screen with some uh, marchers who are holding up Save Lives, Save the Affordable Care Act. And then the one uh, phrase on the screen is extraordinary change. This is such bullshit. And for the party to be pushing out a message roughly six months before the midterm elections and as the primaries are underway, trying to answer the question, what does the Democratic Party stand for? That shows that their polling tells them that there are a lot of us out here who don't know, who don't have a firm idea. And don't feel a connection to the Democratic Party. Today, another protest occurred in Gaza, 
Far fewer than the 50,000 that the New York Times predicted the Israelis would be bracing for. And I'm going to use a phrase here that I am conscious of that might be offensive to some people. But it's an attempt at dark humor. What we saw today was the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, conducting another Friday round of sniper practice using citizens of Gaza as their targets. Six of those demonstrators were killed. One was a teenager. We don't have the details, haven't seen video yet on where those people were. And the Palestinians have gotten uh, resourceful. They rolled tires close to the fence that Israel has set up, and they lit them on fire to produce a smoke screen to make it harder to shoot protesters. And the Israelis brought in first an industrial-sized fan on the back of a big rig and tried to blow the smoke away, and that didn't work. Then they used water cannons, which really didn't put out. You know, tires are hard to extinguish when they're on fire. Then the demonstrators brought out mirrors to reflect the bright midday sun into the eyes of the Israeli snipers. They also rolled out a huge catapult called a trebuchet, which uh, we're told could launch or hurl heavy stones for a distance, and there is no indication that it was actually deployed. And my friend Marjorie Cohn, the retired constitutional law professor from San Diego, has an opinion piece of truth out today saying that the Israelis should be charged with war crimes for last week's killing of 18 Palestinians by live sniper fire. Now we continue to explore the saga of the alleged poisoning of Yuri, I'm, I'm sorry, Sergei and his daughter Yulia Skripal in England. Sergei is the former uh, spy for Russia who became a British double agent and uh, was released to Britain as part of a, a spy deal a few years ago. And I just remember two weeks ago on Bill Maher's show, he said that the Scripples had been killed, blamed the Russians without any evidence, and none of his panelists tried to correct him. But remarkably, we told you yesterday how Yulia has started talking and uh, accepted a phone call from her cousin that the cousin recorded and released. And finally, the medical director of the Salisbury District Hospital reappeared today. Now, we, I, I haven't heard any mention of Christine Blanchard in weeks. And it's been a month and two days since the incident occurred. But she issued a statement saying that Yulia Scripple's strength was improving daily. She'll be released from the hospital soon. I also want to update you on the condition of her father. He is responding well to treatment, improving rapidly, and is no longer in critical condition. But is he awake? Is he talking? What are his symptoms? Does he have burns from this nerve agent? Are there any indications or evidence of what occurred? We get zero. No information. Just this kind of bland, happy talk. And as I quoted her yesterday, Yulia Skip Scripple told her cousin, Everything's okay. He, Dad, is resting now. He's sleeping. Everyone's health is okay. No one has had any irreversible harm. Now, this doesn't play well with the optics of the uh, British-led campaign to demonize Russia, the expulsion of uh, 60 diplomats on each side, and closure of uh, consulates and embassies. And now they're trying to mop up the uh, vice. Uh, this is the Guardian I'm looking at. They're trying to mop up over the exaggerated statements of Boris Johnson, who claimed, quote from the Guardian, wrongly, that the government science facility at Porton Down had attributed the nerve agent to Russia. In fact, the attribution was based on intelligence and analysis of previous Russian state hits. Now, that language is what the New York Times finally refers to in an article that was buried way deep in the A section of the paper, unlike the blaring headlines on page one of Russian Responsibility, for this alleged attack in Salisbury, England. The Times article notes that uh, Britain is facing a challenge as it endeavors to build and maintain an international coalition around the poisoning while keeping much of its evidence secret. They go on to admit that Porton Down finally said that its scientists could not identify the precise source of the chemical 
though it was almost certainly created by a state actor. Almost certainly, they say. And they then just uh, uh, dev devolve to a position, well, who else could have done it? And that is alleged to be proof. Here's a quote from France's ambassador. We share the UK's assessment, namely that there is no other plausible explanation other than Russia's responsibility. I'm sorry, that is not evidence. That is speculation. And let me say, I, I know that not everybody gets to listen to every podcast every day, and you may have missed some of my earlier statements. I, I accept the circumstantial evidence here that the nation with the most likely motive to do this to Sergei Skripal is Russia. But that's just circumstantial and that's just speculation. And we can't base significant foreign policy changes on that kind of unproven stuff. So then, again, The Guardian trying to mop up for the British government British and American authorities have been given several chemical analyses of a substance believed to be a Novichok nerve agent produced in Russia's closed Shikani military facility. It wasn't Russia's. It was the Soviet Union's. It wasn't in Russia. It was in Uzbekistan. They uh, quote, uh, or they cite Boris Kuznetsov, who fled Russia in 2007, said he had handed British diplomats the police case files from 95. <laughs> Uh, uh, alleging the use of a toxic substance which scientists have identified as a product of a Soviet-designed foliant program. A related nerve agent was used in the Salisbury poisoning last month. That is a declaration by The Guardian. It's not a quote. It doesn't cite any evidence. It doesn't cite a source. It doesn't offer any qualification that it's reported, it's alleged, it's asserted with high confidence. It just says it like God spoke and revealed it to them. The documents, some of which had previously been leaked by the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta, were given to British diplomats in Latvia in March. Now, then they say the files may provide rare physical evidence about chemical weapons production. The British case has so far relied more heavily in public on circumstantial evidence and secret intelligence. So they buy it, and we're supposed to buy it because they buy it. And let's keep in mind how these are the intelligence agencies who fixed the intelligence around the policy in 2002 and 2003. Those were the words of the British ambassador to the United States, a guy I've met once, when he reported in to Tony Blair about what he observed in Washington in the run-up to our invasion of Iraq. That's what they're doing here. They are fixing evidence around a preconceived policy of bashing Russia. Now, this descends into some <laughs> kind of silly stuff. Because the Russians, in an effort to highlight the absurdity of all of this, have been inquiring about the health and welfare of the pets that the Scripples had. There were two guinea pigs and two cats. Maybe just one cat. Well, according to one article, this is in The Guardian, the spokesman who said that, uh, you know, reported on the status of the pets said, well, you know, they were in the house which had been sealed off during the police investigation. They believe the guinea pigs died of thirst, but they're wondering about at least one cat. Now, did cat, the cat manage to contact the doorknob where we're told the Novichok agent was deployed? Well, you may find this kind of absurd, and it is. But, get this, the same situation, the same story that I just read from The Guardian is reported this way at Vice. Detectives say that Scripple and his daughter first came into contact with the nerve agent at their home where the poison was heavily concentrated. Well, we're told it was only heavily concentrated on the doorknob. The animals likely came into contact with the poison there, too. So, I, I know cats have quite a range of behaviors, and they can jump, and I can imagine a cat actually could make contact with a doorknob. But a guinea pig? 
I mean, this is where we descend into cartoon land. Every day I pause for, oh, I, I forgot one thing here. The Trump administration has announced new sanctions on seven of Russia's richest, richest men, 17 top government officials. It is for nonspecific offenses. Uh, so they can infer whether it was over Scripple or over meddling in the election or what have you. All right, now, every day I stop for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. People like Pauline Nixon, Marvin Rasmussen, Let's see who this one is. Uh, Eugene Hetzel, I thank each and every one of you for your support of this podcast. And I invite you to join in. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. All you got to do is find the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page, and boom, you can choose a subscription that fits your budget. And today I'm releasing a fresh interview with Cliff Schechter. And as you know, This week, we've covered the exposure of Sinclair Broadcasting, the largest single owner of local television stations in the country, for their uh, mandated message that every news anchor that they employ had to read uh, on camera for delivery to viewers uh, about how they don't run fake news on Sinclair. And Cliff Schechter once worked for Sinclair. He wrote about it in an op-ed for the New York Times this week, and he shared this finding about what he discovered when he was the token liberal commentator for Sinclair Media. I can tell you what I did see, um, and this is similar to what you, you, uh, what was, has been talked about, you know, since this this hostage video that you refer to, that Deadspin put together all these people in these, on all these markets, reading the same exact thing at the same exact time, something out of 1984, quite frankly. Um, And, and uh, that I saw, I saw scripts, you know, that were handed out. Um, I saw talking points. I saw, you know, th- them telling their people to, to all say that George W. Bush was winning the war on terror, and it was Democrats who were trying to stop him from doing that. I spoke to, to a friend of mine, one of whom I'm still friends with to this day, who, who was there, um, and uh, and there, there was a second one, too, the two different reporters who, you know, shared stories about how they were sent off to Iraq to find the positive story there. Mm-hmm. You know, I told you about the Kathleen Kennedy Townsend thing. I mean, it was sort of one thing after another. So it was clear there was a right-wing agenda, but as you bring up, too, it was also clear that it was centralized control. They realized that, you know, Fox News is Fox News. What's even potentially more insidious about this is they know that, you know, in a lot of towns like Cincinnati, where I live and you're originally from, it's not the size of New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. You know the local anchors. Often you actually may see them. You mm-hmm. see them at charity events. You see them at, you run to them at a coffee shop or whatever. So they're trusted. They're people in your community, and therefore – when they're reading a propagandistic statement, it, it, it carries that much more weight because it's the person who you know from your area who's telling you this. And so especially if you're somebody who doesn't pay close attention to the news, you're bound to believe it. And that's what, that's what makes their model even more evil because you think you're getting stuff from, you know, coming from the minds of your local anchors, and you're not. It's coming from – it's cooked up, in, in, as you said, in the warehouse in Baltimore and the headquarters there. I hope you'll grab the full interview with Cliff Schechter. It's interesting and talks about the real risk of the concentration of media ownership, particularly by right-wing entities in this country. It's available for my subscribers at PeterBCollins.com, at iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, and most of our outlets, uh, except for YouTube. The daily news and comment is on YouTube, but not the subscriber interviews. So Trump went to West Virginia. He had a script about how great his tax cuts were and they're going to bring back clean coal and everything's going to be hunky-dory. But he threw away the script and just told a pack of lies. He started by recounting how Democrats were responsible for the event in October last year when an Uzbek immigrant killed eight people with a truck on the West Side Highway. And then he shifted to how uh, Democrats stole his election because millions of people in California voted illegally. And we know that's flatly false. And then he went on a bizarre rant about Mexican rapists. And if I'm interpreting him properly, he he, he said women are raped at levels that have never been seen before. And he's referring to the caravan coming north through Mexico, mostly populated by Hondurans. The reason for the caravan was to protect the women and children from any kind of attack, including rape. And so 
in remarks that were so incoherent that they can only make sense to Trump himself. He then talked about how, well, you know, on the day when I launched and I came down the escalator at Trump Tower and I mentioned rapists in Mexico, uh, people thought I was so tough. No, we thought you're so stupid. And you're a racist pig. Because the idea that a caravan, which is an, an, an attempt to protect people, suggests that Mexico is just a hotbed of rapists is flatly false. And to his claim about election fraud, or voter fraud more accurately, our friend Greg Palast has joined with the ACLU of Kansas, and they are going to sue to insist that Trump and others tell the truth. So Palast is working alongside the ACLU because the double vote list was created by Trump's uh, uh, vote fraud czar, Chris Kobach, as part of his interstate cross-check program. Palast is going to be here in the Bay Area in a couple of weeks, and we've lined up an interview. We'll talk about that in more depth. Also on the way back from West Virginia, uh, Trump stepped in it. He finally made a comment about the Stormy Daniels case, but by saying he didn't know why his attorney Michael Cohen paid her off to be quiet, the hush money deal, well, his comments create a predicament because the Clifford case, uh, Stormy Daniels case, is based on the notion that the confidentiality agreement is invalid because Trump was not a party to it. And by saying that he wasn't aware of it, he appeared to confirm that argument, which means that she may not be bound by the hush money agreement. (laughs) Oh, and some evangelical leaders say they're planning to meet with Trump in June, not apparently to pray with him on his sins, but to talk about the risk that his behavior, both his affairs and his divisive politics risk the midterm elections for the Republican Party. Well, this week's been a tough one for Scott Pruitt, the wrecking crew leader over at the EPA. And as of Friday, he still has a gig. But John Kelly, the White House chief of staff, told Trump last week that he should fire Pruitt. Then we learned from an AP story that uh, John Kelly has been uh, basically had his role diminished by Trump and that uh, Trump has not consulted him on inviting Putin to the White House, on appointing uh, John Bolton, or on uh, issues related to some of the tariffs. So uh, Kelly, is uh, his his orbit is being eclipsed, and Scott Pruitt appears to be uh, cruising for one of those final tweets from Trump. There's a great rundown of his uh, violations in Vice News today, and I'll link to it in the show file for today's podcast so you can take a look. Well, as always this week, I have more news than I have room to fit in today. I've already hit my uh, limit here, but I'm going to push through on one more set of stories here about what's going on at Facebook. Because uh, Sheryl Sandberg has finally broken her silence. I saw her give an interview to uh, uh, Judy Woodruff on the PBS NewsHour last night. And I have to say that the comments from Sandberg and from Zuckerberg are pretty lame. Uh, They've been sitting on this knowledge for a long time, and they're only being brought public about it because of the threat of regulation. And to the question of whether we are the product of Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg said, oh, that's not true. Here's how our business works. We don't sell data ever. We don't give personal data to advertisers. They come onto our Facebook platform. They want to do targeted ads. That's really important. But people want to show ads. We take those ads, we show them, and then we don't pass any individual information back to the advertiser. No, we're not the product you're selling. We just monetize you, which is a difference with no distinction. And we're also learning that Facebook is announcing new rules to require verified identities for political advertisers in the future. Uh, You'll have to be able to verify identity and location so they know you're in Russia when you (laughs) place those silly ads on Facebook. Still, nobody is mentioning the Hillary Clinton troll farm run by David Brock. Uh, They don't mention the $80 million that Trump used with dark targeted ads on Facebook. And so this, this is a story that I find very frustrating. Also, BuzzFeed tries to make a big deal out of what they call a two-tiered privacy system at Facebook. And what they don't acknowledge, 
as they report that Zuckerberg and executives can use Snapchat, Signal, and other platforms that have better user privacy. Well, Facebook internally operates a, a, a a system that is just like the public Facebook, but it's only available to employees. That's how they communicate internally. And so the idea that they have different privacy features from the public is not a shock to me. And finally, an op-ed at The Guardian is worth your perusal because Salome Viljon points out that because of the Republican rollback of a rule that was forged in the final year of the Obama administration, that your information is much more vulnerable to your Internet service provider, like Comcast, AT&T, or Verizon, because they collect far more personal data. Specifically, how much time you spend at Pornhub is known to Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon, but it's not, at least to my knowledge, something that is collected by Facebook. Now, if you have Facebook running while you go to Pornhub, I do believe there's a possibility that Facebook can pick up that activity. But uh, it is fair to say that the ISPs have more power over your data than Facebook does at this point. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's free. You're free to share it far and wide. We post this one on on uh, YouTube. And when you're there, click on the subscribe button, will you? No money involved. Happy trails to you until Again, happy trails.